We want them to make a connection, a connection of the 20th century, nearly a hundred years ago, vacation land began here in Wayne, Pike, and all the other surrounding counties. Happy 2024. This is Pocono Mountains Podcast, Season 3, Episode 34. I'm Jim Hamill. It's a new year, and we have a great Pocono Mountains magazine for January lined up for you, premiering Sunday on PTN. Some great stories, including one that connects the Poconos' vacation land a century ago with today's hospitality options. One of the ways a historical society in Wayne and Pike counties is keeping that history relevant is with a map hand-drawn depicting the Lake Wall and Popback region in the 1930s, and now selling the map's update to support the mission of keeping history alive here in the Poconos. More on that in a bit. The Poconos is a year-round destination for millions, with 2,400 square miles of mountains, forests, lakes, and rivers, with historic downtowns and iconic family resorts. It's the perfect getaway. You can always find out more on PoconoMountains.com or watch PTN, the Pocono Television Network, streaming live 24-7. Now back to the episode. The Green Dreher Historical Society has a huge number of volunteers. PTN even stopped in when the Historical Society was hosting its Volunteer Appreciation Luncheon. It has also reproduced a map, nearly a century old, depicting the region during the beginnings of its days as a vacation destination. The Vacation Land Vintage Map is $18, a great way to contribute to the preservation of the region's history and support the Historical Society. I spoke with several of its members for this podcast episode. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. It's Jim Hamill with Pocono Mountains Podcast, and I am here in Green Drear Historical Society's second floor. This place has so much history around us right now, and we're joined by board member Ellen Drake. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Tell us a little bit about what it's so what is so neat about oh. preserving history here in this area. This area goes back to the Connecticut settlers moving into the Wyoming Valley. The Moravians on their mission from Bethlehem and Nazareth came here. It's a marvelous community, quiet, but yet modern in some ways, but we love our history as you can see around us today. You guys uh, no doubt spend a lot of time having programs, uh, preserving different exhibits that we have around us here. I see we have um, you know, a spinster's wheel, we have you know, a tiny toilet, you know, from back in the day. But all of these things tell a story, right, about people and how they, they they got through their times. And so tell me about the story of, of this area and what you guys try to leave for, for the current generation and future generations. We want to give them not only what was here, but what's still growing from that root here. We know the stories behind most of these items. We know the people that use them. And their families are still here as we greet new families. We can pass that history along to them and bring them into the community and make them feel a part of our community, which we really do want to do. I think one of those through lines then too, because you know we talk about it so much about how the Pocono Mountains as a destination has provided this vacation destination for just you know so many generations and still does to this day. But you guys have now this project, this map that conjures up, you know, that that era of the 1930s and 40s that was, you know, so strong with tourism and vacations here. What are you guys trying to do with that map to let people know that this has really always been intertwined with this region, right? We want them to make a connection, a connection of the 20th century, nearly 100 years ago. Vacation land began here in Wayne, Pike, and all the other surrounding counties. And we want them to see that that has come full circle, in my estimation. We started out small, small resorts, family homes becoming boarding houses. And here we are with vacation people looking for that same experience, that experience of being at home, something small, something family-oriented. And we can give that to them and we can give them the history here. So tell me that process then. You guys had a map and you had members then who will no doubt explain, you know, in a little bit their process. But what do you think the end result is here? Something that people can look to with pride, right? And have there as a reference point for that historical perspective. Absolutely. Because many of these historical homes 
are not operating as boarding houses, but they are here and they're being preserved. And we're starting a whole new community of those kinds of boarding houses, Airbnbs, VRBOs today. Mm -hmm. So I think we can bring it all together for them. That's really unique, right? Uh, you know, you said you grew up down uh, Wyoming Valley. Yes. But to, to have, you know, uh, this area just be that that history uh, and um, legacy of hospitality. We were talking about the white beauty views, the silver birches. I mean, those are places that gave way to what we have today, you know, in the settlers and the woodlocks and, you know, the very big resorts in Monroe County, too. Oh, we have an image of the early silver birches and what it started out as simply an enlarged home on the ba on the banks of the lake a lot of the properties grew out of that lake so that lake has a big history to play here and i know Absolutely. Walt Back creek comes right down through here too so so this area has been transformed by that singular decision to build a hydroelectric dam and have a lake there too as not just you know something that provides electricity and power but provides an industry overall an industry that's been a core of our existence here yeah truly yeah that's amazing isn't it mm -hmm. um anything else that you'd like to share with uh, about the mission of the historical society well, here the mission is to protect all of our local history not only items that you might see around me but the oral histories mm -hmm. the histories of our veterans we have published books about the area and we are committed to keeping that history alive. And we're now moving into the mid-century because the mid-century is now ancient history for a lot of people. Good point. Yeah, there yeah. Ellen Drake, thank you for joining You're us welcome. here. I think we'll have Bernadine join us next, but uh, we really appreciate all you do here for the greater Pocono Mountains and preserving that history and that legacy, not just of hospitality, but of, of who we were and who we are now. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jim. We appreciate having you here with us today. My pleasure. We want to thank Ellen Drake again from the Green Dreary Historical Society and now move to her colleague, Bernadine Lennon, who has been here with the board as well for quite a long time and really enjoys some of the research pieces of looking back and dispelling myths that might exist in this, you know, by county area here or mm -hmm. by township area, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, crossing Pike and Wayne counties. Mm -hmm. um, Bernadine, tell me what it is you like to do because you know, this is a volunteer position. And mm -hmm. so you give of your time and your talents to help research here, right? I do. I do research. Um, and that's what that's what keeps me motivated. And it's very rewarding. Um, I like working on my own at my own pace. And so uh, when questions come up from members or the general public that we can't answer, I like to follow those. Um, and I've uncovered some things that people through the ages has, have forgotten. And so that's what I bring to light. Um, Diane and I had collaborated on uh, a presentation about the Moravian settlement in Newfoundland. Okay. And uh, that led to some new information through our research and then eventually to her contacting um, someone who could translate the pastor's letters, who the pastors from the Newfoundland Moravian Church. Okay. So it's that kind of thing that, um, you know, we discover and make public for people. And this facility is something where you get a labor of love. You've really put a lot of effort into mm -hmm. uh, preserving a lot of the the, uh, the relics here. The, the, the exhibits here are, are, are well set up for the mm -hmm. public to, to see. And so what is that value, you think, to a community to have some place like this where they can mm -hmm. go to see all about their own past? Mm -hmm. Um, well, what's what's neat about this and probably other historical societies that we only accept items that uh, have a provenance from the local community. We're not an antique store. Sure. Um, so we research whatever comes in, provide that background um, through narratives and interpretive displays. And then when people come in, they can get that connection of roots to the local area, whether they lived here or not. They may not have known that their grandmother quilted, but we have a picture of her quilting for example, or they may not have known that their grandfather repaired boots like many farmers repaired boots. There wasn't a shoemaker in the area. Um, and so we have some of the shoemaker's tools that were donated to us. So those are the th kinds of things I think that we bring to the public that they wouldn't have known otherwise. And of course we do that with the school students too. It's not only adults that we um, support, but the local South Elementary School, we provide programs for them as well. Yeah, yeah. Those, those programs too, you, you need to keep that 
um, that story alive for the future generations and mm-hmm. to to ignite a little interest mm-hmm. in, in the younger folks so that they grow up with a, a profound uh, appreciation for it, right? Exactly. And, uh, and a, a topic that we've often overlooked, not only us, but other historical societies, is the role of um, Native Americans in the area, the Lenape. We always start off history with the first colonists coming here, or the first settlers. And um, recently we, we became aware and are promoting that history now of the Lenape through artifacts that were donated to us, arrowheads. And we're working with the um, high school, Wall and Pawpack High School, to have those replicated in 3D so that they can be then on display at the South Elementary School. So, um, yeah, that's been really rewarding. That's amazing. So you really do kind of keep things somewhat relevant to to, to modern day, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, talking about the map that is kind of like the focal point of this piece that we're producing for Pocono Mountains Magazine is that, you know, we've had this history of boarding houses and you know, resorts that, that cropped up a hundred more years ago. Mm-hmm. And now it's ever more still present here because of the natural beauty that we have, the proximity to the third largest man-made lake in mm-hmm. the state of Pennsylvania, Walpaw Pack, and just overall, you know, our proximity to to a lot of people who want to leave the, the metropolitan areas to visit what we have here. Right? Exactly. And it's almost come full circle with the boarding houses because we have Airbnbs now. We had bed. And, we have bed and breakfasts yeah. uh, that are popping up. So um, you know, it's kind of neat to to see that. Uh, of course, that was a secondary income back in the day, where the poster dis- depicts the boarding houses um, because farming was the primary income source. Whereas today, bed and breakfast and Airbnbs can be you know pretty much primary if they right. can make it happen. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think that's a really unique perspective that I didn't know uh, firsthand. Uh, before just now. Mm-hmm. Of course, that does make sense though. The agriculture was, you know, one of the bigger things that uh, sustained mm-hmm. families here um, and that it was a secondary, hey, we have the space. Why don't we uh, share what we have, the exactly. land, the, the the views and the natural resources that surround us. Mm-hmm. But now, you know, agriculture has kind of shifted in a lot of ways. There there are still pockets and there are still, you know, places like Wall and Pawpack Creek Farm, mm-hmm. like we talked about that, mm-hmm. that provide event space and provide like this um, ability for people to appreciate, you know, what happens on a farm. Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they do an excellent job of that, too. They really Absolutely. Do. Well, yeah. Bernadine Lennon with the Green Dreer Historical Society, thank you for joining us here on Pocono Mountains Podcast. And I think we're going to ask Diane to give us a little explainer on this wonderful <laughs> map you guys have produced. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're back now with a third member of the Green Dreer Historical Society. And this is Diane Smith, who has a pretty great talent here. She has taken a uh, nearly 100-year-old map created, you know, in the mid-20th century and updated it to be this beautiful uh, representation of what vacation land was, the Pocono Mountains, northern Pocono Mountains here. Diane, uh, thanks for joining us here on the podcast. And just give me an idea of your process here. You saw this thing that was, you know, from a time in history, and you said, this is still relevant today, right? Yes. Well, I... I had this old tattered map, discolored with age, and I showed it to the board and everyone went, wow, this is so cool. So um, with their support, I scanned it, high resolution, uh, so it would keep its crispness and clarity, and um, went to work to make it a little bit prettier, uh, colored in all the letters and the water and um the background of the pictures and the little signs just to make them pop so people could see it. And and we're certainly going to share, you know, on the uh, video portion of this for Pocono Mountains Magazine, some very up close mm-hmm. aspects of this. But in describing it here, you know, it brings this nostalgia out, right, of, of, a, of a time where there was this burgeoning Pocono Mountains hospitality and vacation land at boarding houses, at resorts, the old white beauty. And here... I love this. It says White Beauty View, the most popular spot on the lake. Mm -hmm. What do you think about a lot of these historical spots that either are here today, like the Silver Birches, now a Settlers Hospitality Group uh, Mm -hmm. property, or any of the others that have gone by the wayside? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of them are familiar (laughs) because I grew up here. So I I remember a lot of these places. Uh, Not all of them are there, but some still are. I worked at Nevity Lodge at one time. And I put that picture on here to 
so everyone could see what it looked like. Um, but I really like the uh, the way they advertise themselves, the little phrases, right. modern conveniences, and uh, farm to table, uh, products grown on our own farm. Get out. Um, How about that? A lot of places advertise fishing and boating. Mm -hmm. um, the gas stations are there because this was the age of the automobile. Right, right. So people needed to know where they could get gas. And and to think of just how uh, it's it's shifted over the decades, over the century or so. Uh, the the lake, the hydroelectric lake, then dammed up there too, really kind of spawning a lot of what is here today. And even though it's shifted a lot, we still now have this uh, proliferation of different, whether it's B and Bs or Airbnbs, short term rentals. Mm -hmm. So so really, what's old is new again. Right, right. Um, I love the little uh, messages to, to tourists about um, abundant laurel and uh, mm -hmm. reminders to prevent forest fires. And, uh, this one the, says to Philadelphia. Right, to Philadelphia. <laughs> That's a long ways to Philly on 402. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure uh, people who were first-time visitors found it helpful. It sure, certainly did. Uh, yeah, it's very unique, and I, I implore everybody who you know, is listening to the podcast um, to, to get a copy of this. You can find a copy of it on your website. Right. That is green, G-R-E-E-N-E, -E -E, drear, D-R-E-H-E-R-H-S, for right. historical society, right. dot org. Right. And, and that's a really unique map that now people can purchase, too, to help support right. your mission. Right. How can they do that? Online? Uh, here in person? Where can um, they do it? It's available here when the museum is open. Um, it's available at the Greentown Agway. Very good. Uh, they have a, a, a table of our, our publications, and it's stocked with our maps also. And, uh, and of course, on the website, there's an uh, order form that you can download and uh, purchase it. And it's enlarged, too. You said the original was a little bit smaller. Uh, so, so this is enlarged and kind of... Uh, added to a little. The size that we sell is 18 by 24. Okay. And it doesn't have the postcards. It's I just the map. Just the map then. And and I love this too, just uh, thinking about this uh, nearly a century ago. This was compiled and designed by uh, a gentleman by the name of William Bumbala, the record in Stroudsburg, PA. And it's got, you know, mounted deer head here, you know, <laughs> antlers, um, you know, in the scale of miles. So it's really intricately created it, design. It's hand drawn. It's hand drawn. He drew that and lettered it by hand. That's so unique. Well, we appreciate you sharing it with us here on Pocono Mountains Thank Podcast. Thank you for coming. And yes, we, we act, absolutely uh, adore the idea of just, you know, this historical aspect of things still is relevant today throughout our Pocono Mountains and especially here around Lake Wall, Pawpack and Wayne and Pike County. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. The Vacation Land Map, vintage and very much relevant to today. Find out on the new Pocono Mountains magazine how two owners of a home in the Jim Thorpe area are keeping that tradition very much alive and well. We'll have the extended version of their interview on a future Pocono Mountains podcast from the comfy confines of the Flagstaff Lodge. Thanks for listening to Pocono Mountains podcast. We'll have a new episode each week highlighting lots of the fun things you can experience while you're visiting the Poconos. Subscribe and leave a review and or comment on whatever platform you listen. Whether you're a beginner like Chris or just need a refresher, the Pocono Mountains is a place to learn to ski and board. Our ski resorts have the latest ski and snowboard rentals. Plus, the instructors are top notch. Now is the time for you and your family to learn to ski. Go to PoconoSki.com. We're back. Thanks for listening to Pocono Mountains Podcast. I'm Jim Hamill. Now for a Pocono Mountains Podcast Extra. A few years ago, Chris Barrett chatted with Ingrid at the Zane Gray Museum in Lackawaxen about what folks can learn at that museum. The National Park Service maintains that wonderful museum, and it's the starting location of some Eagle Watch bus tours we shared with you around this time last year through the Delaware Highlands Conservancy. Here's Chris and Ingrid at the Zane Gray Museum. Enjoy. 
Hi, everyone. We are back. This is PTN, the Pocono Television Network. We are so happy to have you with us, as always, watching. And we're also real happy to be at the Zane Gray Museum. This is a real, real treat for us. We're going to get to that shortly. But before we do, I just wanted a quick shout out to Jeff, who is the president of PEAK. It's Pocono Environmental Education Center. If you've never been there, we really encourage you to go. If you want to learn about the environment and sustainability, take a really great nature hike. And uh, while you're doing that, learn about what the environment is around you. It's a great place to go. Watch it right here on PTN. Uh, Jeff, we thank you and for opening your arms to us and, and your crew as well uh, at Peak, and we thank you very much. So Ingrid, Zane Gray, why is he not as well known as he probably should be? I think he's probably not as well known um, given the fact that he began his writing in the first half of the 20th century. You know, he started writing in the teens, the 20s, the 30s, and he was really writing at a time when people did not have the ability to be mobile like we are today. So when Zane Gray does his writing, he's very descriptive in his writing. So you get a feel for the West, you get a feel for the canyons. And so I think that's really one of the main reasons that he was so popular as a writer. And as all things go, things run their course. And, and today people don't really read Westerns like they did at that time. And I think what's interesting was he really started his early life as a dentist, right? He actually went to the University of Pennsylvania. Where he played in, baseball, right? He no, played baseball. He did. So he actually went there on a baseball scholarship and it allowed him to pursue dentistry. He got his degree in dentistry and it really wasn't something that he really enjoyed doing. Um, baseball was something that he always had a love in his heart for. And so when he graduated in 1896, he actually went on to play amateur baseball for a while for the Orange Athletic Club in Orange, New Jersey, before he finally set up his dental practice in New York City. So really, what got him interested in writing? Was it just a love of the outdoors or what was it? I really don't know what kind of sparked his interest. Maybe it was something that was always in his heart, but I think he got his first um, real desire to write because of his trips up here to Lackawaxen and, and particularly the Delaware River. So he and his brother would come up from New York City on the Erie Railroad and they would do a lot of fishing on the Delaware River. And it was one of those experiences that he had fishing and he turned that into an article entitled A Day on the Delaware, which was published in Recreation Magazine. So I think that's really kind of what triggered him, his desire to be a writer. That's really interesting. And then he actually concentrated on the West. So Riders of the Purple Sage, to me, is such a, a, a classic Western. And how did he really get that interest? <clears throat> yeah, so it's the Western living here in Lackawax. Right. And how does that happen? Right, right. Um, it really started when he and his wife, Dolly, went on their honeymoon in 1906. And they traveled out to the Grand Canyon. And he really kind of immersed himself into the Western culture, the people that are living there, and then continued on to California. So growing up in Ohio, living in New York, he really didn't have that, and it really just inspired him to want to write about the West. He wrote really over a hundred different pieces of work. So the Westerns are the predominant. That's what everybody knows him for. But he also wrote books on fishing as well. So he taught, wrote about his experiences up in the Northwest, in Tahiti, in the Virgin Islands. So all combined... I'd say really over 100. I think that his focus um, really was the West. I think that's what he found his niche in, and that's really where he concentrated and focused his, his writing on. And I think having that ability to, to go out West and, and make trips to places like New Mexico and Arizona really gave him the inspiration and the material that he needed to do his writing. And I think just interacting with the people out in those states, 
um, inspired him as well. And he incorporated a lot of the people that he met into his stories and books. So he, another thing too is I, I think what I find fascinating is the early days of film. Mm -hmm. And then I guess from the 1925 through the 50s, so there were Westerns were, and even into the 60s, I guess you can say, there were so many Westerns that Hollywood produced. There's so many Western themes. And he was right at the forefront of that, wasn't he? Absolutely. So the, the film industry really began in the teens in this country. So while Zane Gray is living here in Lackawaxen, and writing Riders of the Purple Sage and Heritage of the Desert, out in California, the film industry is taking off. And just like today, when um, producers or people wanting to write or make movies, they naturally turn to popular books. And so Zane Gray's books are on the top of the bestseller list. Everybody is reading Zane Gray. So it was only natural that they would turn to his books to be turned into movies. And so the early um, film Riders of the Purple Sage was made in 1918. And then they continued, as you said, on into the teens, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, into the 50s. Even they, Zane Grey Theater on television and Dick Powell's Zane Grey Theater. Absolutely. So in the 1950s, um, the whole Western genre is still very popular. And so they turned to Zane Grey and they developed the Zane Grey Theater for television. So now he's made that transition from movies into television with that. And he actually passed away in 1939, correct? Absolutely. So it really outlived him. It for, did. So that, it did. And what was he like as a person? Like, how did he write? What did, what did he do every day when he got up, when he was in Lackawaxen or wherever he was? I For Zane Grey, with his writing, he um, would kind of sit down with his thoughts, his ideas, and he would sit and write everything out in longhand. So he'd sit in his chair, write it all down. No laptops, no, no word laptops, processors. Absolutely not. So it's all handwritten. And then when he was finished with his manuscripts, he would hand it off to his wife. And she's the one that would edit it, all his work to make sure that it flowed, if it needed to be reworked and everything. And then eventually, when they start, made money, they Zane Gray and his wife were able to afford secretaries. So they were able to then type his manuscripts up. So no, it was definitely very hand down from, from his brain down to, to the paper. So uh, I guess we got to, we have time for one question. Mm -hmm. So really, what do you think his legacy is? If, if, if someone here, I'm sure there are groups that ask you that all the mm -hmm. time, what is his legacy? I think his legacy is really the impact that he had on popular culture in the first half of the 20th century. Um, he really made an impact on people's lives. He came into their homes, whether it was through the stories, whether it was through magazines, and his books were done in serial form, or whether they actually went out into the theater to watch his books. And he also, with a fishing as well, so if you didn't know him as a Western writer, you knew him as a fisherman. So you could buy a Zane Grey lure, and you could mm. go out and fish and feel like you were a Zane Grey fisherman. Wow. Well, I'm, I mean, we could stay here all day, but unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Uh, Ingrid, thank you so much for hosting us. You've been great. And, and Ingrid is one of the people you can actually see right here at the Zangray Museum. She hosts groups, she interprets, she does a lot of great things. This is one of the unique, really cool things about the Pocono Mountains that we talk about all the time. Uh, seeing real people here dedicating their lives to someone's legacy who is a real icon in American culture. So for Ingrid and for the crew, I want to say thank you so much for watching PTN, the Pocono Television Network. And as always, happy to have you. the Zay Gray Museum, and Green Trayer Historical Society, keeping history alive here in the Pocono Mountains. We hope you enjoyed Pocono Mountains podcast. Please remember to subscribe anywhere podcasts are available. Come visit us in the Pocono Mountains. Plan your trip today. <music>